avancées considérables sur le, sur le continent en matière de promotion et de protection des droits de l'homme. Cependant, beaucoup d'avancées restent à noter en ce qui concerne le cas de la xénophobie en Afrique du Sud. Il est aussi à noter que les ONG, par leur efficacité et leur collaboration, ont pu travailler en partenariat avec la Commission pour effectuer la promotion et aussi le plaidoyer sur les situations connexes dans les États membres. Lors de sa présentation, la présidente de la Commission africaine de droits de l'homme a salué l'impact des activités des ONG de travail de la Commission africaine. Et il faut aussi noter que les ONG jouent un rôle très important dans la réalisation de son mandat, à savoir la soumission, notamment, de rapports alternatifs au rapport périodique des États qui permet à la Commission de se faire une meilleure idée de l'application des dispositions de la Charte africaine par les différents États membres. Et aussi, les ONG sont souvent représentées, ont souvent représenté pardon, les victimes d'abus des droits de l'homme en saisissant la Commission africaine, utilisant ainsi le mandat de protection de la Commission. Après la présentation de la présidence, il a été procédé à l'ouverture du Forum des ONG. Après cette session, nous avons eu la présentation des différents points focaux sur la, sur la situation régionale des droits de l'homme sur le continent. De part et d'autre des différentes interventions que nous avons eues, nous avons noté un dénominateur commun qui est l'avancée et le travail effectué par la société civile africaine. La société civile africaine a contribué de par son efficacité à un rôle de veille et aussi à un rôle de plaidoyer pour améliorer la situation des droits de l'homme sur le continent. Mais il est à noter différentes violations, à savoir les arrestations arbitraires, les détentions, l'interdiction de se prononcer dans différents états. Les différents intervenants ont réitéré leur engagement et ont appelé les autorités compétentes à soutenir les activités de la société civile. Après cela, nous avons eu deux, deux autres sessions qui se sont accentuées. L'une sur le cas de la xénophobie en Afrique du Sud et l'autre sur le travail et l'intervention des ONG militants pour les droits des femmes. Donc, en outre, la première journée d'hier était riche, à savoir les participations de chaque intervenant et aussi les activités qui ont été effectuées en matière de plaidoyer, de sensibilisation et d'engagement. Merci beaucoup. Good morning, honorable commissioner Fayette Amaika, Excellency. Uh, uh, representative of NGOs, I'm very pleased to be here uh, today with you to discuss one of uh, the serious uh, issues, which is the protection of refugees, IDPs, and migrants in, in our continent in Africa. 
So to, to 2019 is a significant year for civil society, working on forced displacement, migration, and refugees. The first year of the implementation of the Global Compact of Safe, Regular, and Orderly Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees, which will end with the first Global Refugee Forum to take place in December 2019 in Geneva. The implementation of the compact represents a challenges and opportunity for civil society. Effectively, people on the move, for example, in Africa, we have different rooms in Africa to, 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 to go to, to the north in order to, to reach the so-called paradise. They face, during their move and during their journey, they face a terrible situation, miserable situation. Some of them, for example, those who take the road from Eritrea, Ethiopia to, to reach to Libya through Sinai, they find themselves kidnapped. They find themselves sold in a in, 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 in market. They find themselves, their family find themselves paying a ransom for the kidnapper. So here, that's why we are, uh, we are tackling this issue. And we shall see it from different perspectives, mainly from North Africa and the region of Sahel, Sahel and Sahara. So tackling this, uh, this issue will be through answering some questions who is IDP and who is refugee, what the challenges uh, IDPs are facing and refugees. And the key word here in our panel is the protection. How can we protect the, the, those people on the move? To that, I'm very pleased to introduce you our prominent uh, panelists. To my right, Mrs. Uh, Watara Florence, she is from Burkina Faso. She is the coordinator of the Coalition of, Hum uh, of Human Rights Defenders. To my left, Mr. Ashraf Mila Kruksi. He is a lawyer. He is an expert in refugee. He has worked with the United Nations organs, especially the High Commissioner, for more than five years in the issue of refugees. Mr. Filet Hamadi, a professor, is uh, uh, officer, advocacy officer of the Independent Commission for Human Rights. So, if I start with you, Mr. Ashraf, <clears throat> and uh, I will ask you, what are the challenges that uh, that uh, that migrant IDP and refugees are facing in North Africa? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so before I ask you a question, just I need to reiterate that uh, the OAU Convention, 1969 Convention, is more general than the 1951 Convention. It gave broader rights for to of persecution if you are persecuted on one of these five grounds or you are a refugee. However, in 1969, the African OAU at that time, currently the African Union. They issued the uh, important document, as, which is as important as the uh, Kampala Convention on IDPs. This is a unique also kind of document related to the IDPs. We, all, we only have guidelines for the protection of IDPs, but in Africa we have the Kampala Convention, which is something more, even more progressive if we are talking regional. Um, so if we are talking about the five grounds per se, uh, in the uh, and the Egyptian Convention, which are political opinion, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, and religion. So the 1969 Convention had more four uh, criteria, if we may call it, which is if the country is subject to foreign domination, occupation, external oppression, or events that seriously uh, disturb public order, which shows that this is like something specific that has to do with the situation of the ongoing situation in Africa. 
So we have approved that kind of criteria, and let me also add that it's, that it's also applicable on non-Africans. For some time in Egypt, that UNHCR in Latin the Commission for Refugees in Egypt, was applying the 1969 Convention on the Iraqis, those who are fleeing the external aggression which happened by the Americans in, on 19th of March 2003. If I remember, I remember correctly. So, this is the broader kind of definition of refugees. That's why I was a little bit honestly surprised that most of us don't know uh, about this convention. So if I talk about the uh, challenges faced by the refugees and migrants in North Africa, so allow me let's just to talk in general about North Africa, and then I will have a special focus on Egypt, as we agreed earlier. So if we start by Libya, of course, everybody here knows that Libya, the situation in Libya, political and the uh, security situation in Libya, is far from stability. So it's not, of course, a destination for refugees. It's just a transit kind of country. Uh, exactly like Egypt. The only difference is in Egypt, people, like migrants and refugees, would apply for refugee status and then wait to be legally resettled in a third safe country, which would be Europe, uh, United States, Australia, or even Canada. But in Libya, people know that they would, uh, they would cross uh, the Mediterranean just to reach Europe, and then they would seek asylum there. The big issue there is now the militias. The militias starting from the downfall of the Gaddafi regime in 2011 are taking what, what we may call toll, you know, like, like taking some kind of taxes for those irregular migrants who are leaving the Libyan shores towards, towards Europe. So at some point, and even according to uh, a report by Human Rights Watch, that some country paid these militias in order to capture these poor African migrants, torture them, make them like sex slaves, even put them in detention underground just to prevent them from crossing the Mediterranean. Europe started, of course, if you reach the European shores that you are more than welcome as an asylum seeker, and then the RSK refugee status determination process would start. But sometimes the Europeans, they were afraid of the mass influx of migrants, started, I mean, intensively, including started from the summer of 2013 from the Libyan shores and then the Libyan shores. So in this case, that this militia started capturing these people and tortured them. And even one of the uh, Libyan parliament members said that, and, and it's clear that what kind of motivation he has, Libya is not going to be a big refugee camp for Africans. So it's an indication that there was even some kind of pressure from the European side, hey, wait, 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 either you block these people from crossing the Mediterranean. So if we go back to history in 2005, Italy was paying Gaddafi lots of money in order to prevent these migrants from crossing the Mediterranean, to have full control over the shores. Even when the NATO was bombarding Libya in 2001, one of the threats of Gaddafi said, okay, I'm going to let the uh, migrants cross the Mediterranean, so you're going to be, you, you'll have the massive influx of, of migrants and, and asylum seekers. And I think the same kind of threat was declared by Erdogan of Turkey last week when he said that if Europe called my operation in Syria as an invasion, so I would send you like 3 million uh, refugees. So refugees, unfortunately, are dealt with as a political kind of, uh, of, of, of like a playing card, if we may use it. So it's not a humanitarian fight at all, unfortunately, in all, all over Africa, if we may call it. Second issue is that uh, there was some kind of pressure from the uh, European Union, EU, over Turkey, Egypt, Libya, and Morocco in order to have what they call a platform for the return migrants. If I cross the Mediterranean and go to Libya, to, to, the, to Italy or wherever, the refugee status determination interview is done, and if I'm proven not to be a refugee, if I don't fill the British criteria, so I should be returned. So most of the migrants, they tend to destroy their passports so that they will not be forced to be returned to their country. So the EU will ask these countries to uh, establish this kind of platform, to receive these people even temporarily until they see what to do with them if they enter the Europe. In other words, interrogated to be returned to their countries. 
So in 2016, Turkey uh, responded positively to this uh, request and established this kind of platform over the Aegean Sea. So the European Sea, that the Mediterranean here, so this is the, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, which is the Aegean Sea, to prevent migrants going to, uh, to Greece, so that they're going to be returned to Turkey, and then Egypt in the middle, and Egypt and Libya in the middle, and then Morocco to the west. Only Turkey accepted this kind of offer, but Egypt, Libya, and Morocco are still, I don't want to say resisting, but they're still reluctant to do it. Maybe I will talk in details about the situation in Egypt with migrants and refugees, but this is the current situation in Libya. Uh, it's not a safe haven for refugees or even migrants. Uh, Tunisia, of course, the, the biggest bulk of refugees in Tunisia are the, the Libyans, starting from the downfall of the Gaddafi regime in 2011. And it's um, the, the number estimated between 1 million, I mean, the official number is 1 million, but other estimations go further than that and say it's 1.8 million. 1,800,000, because some people are unregistered, some people are in the southern part of Tunisia, some people just entered the country and then they found their way through the sea, but the unofficial estimation is 1,800,000. Tunisia, I don't know what we call it, but since uh, we have a bilateral agreement with Libya in 1973, which allows both citizens to, to enter both countries without visa, so they couldn't uh, prevent it. However, uh, the Tunisian security, they have a big fear that in 2016, there was uh, an explosion, a big explosion in Libya, <coughs> run by ISIS Libyan branch, and many members of this ISIS Libyan branch were Tunisians. So they were afraid of retaliation by some of the Libyan militias to come and just do some kind of terrorist attacks in Tunisia. So they're doing some kind of control around people, but from time to time, they would like close the borders with, the, with Libya. Of course, if I'm legally speaking here, yeah, this is a clear violation of uh, Article 71 of the 1951 Convention relating to the right to entry or even the regular entry to the country as long as you are here an asylum seeker, but for security reasons that Tunisia is closing the borders. Libyans don't have big problems, just except for some kind of instigation by the media in Tunisia accusing Libyans of um, doing some kind of indecent acts, according to the, uh, this is not my expression, it's their expression, so which instigates some kind of limited actions, not that they are limited uh, violent actions against Libyans in Tunisia. Talking about Algeria, Algeria, the, the number is estimated at half a million. 100,000 are Syrians, and the others are coming from Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. Niger. Egypt. So these people, these 400,000, the, uh, the authorities in Algeria is not uh, chasing them because they know that they're having a hard time and they're also dispersed in the desert so they are not imposing or they don't represent a big bulk of uh, refugees from, from a specific region or so. They don't have much problems. In Peru, there are many migrants and refugees coming from Sub-Saharan Africa to Morocco, either to settle down in Morocco or to cross the Mediterranean via Gibraltar in the, over the Mediterranean. But in this case, that uh, the Moroccan authorities had this kind of pressure of establishing this uh, platform of the return refugees from European part. That's why I'm uh, just my estimation that is the legalization of the status of over 25,000 refugees and asylum seekers in Morocco was concurrent with the, the pressure of the EU over Morocco in order to establish this kind of platform which is totally rejected by, as I said, Morocco, Libya, and Egypt. Um, so talking about Egypt, as I said, it's also a transit country for refugees. The total number of registered or recognized, not recognized, I mean those who are under the mandate of the UNHCR, the United Nations Convention for Refugees in Egypt, is 230,000 uh, asylum seekers and refugees. 
150,000 which are Syrians, the others are Sudanese, Somalis, Ethiopians, Eritreans, and of course Iraqis, Libyans, Yemenis, and um, this number of course is not the total number, the total number that is exceeding 2 million. Uh, until 2005, the majority of refugees in Egypt were Sudanese. By 2005, there was a massive influx of refugees coming from Iraq because of the, the clashes between insurgents there. And in 2011, the, the migration, the massive influx of migration from the Syrians uh, changed the form, the, the composition of the refugee population in Egypt. So Sudanese, I think, became now like 22, 23 percent of the total refugee population. However, as I said, there are more than one million Sudanese refugees residing in Egypt without being registered by uh, at UNICEF. And also, there are other uh, refugees who I feel that they fell from the cracks. So they have a, a, a refugee status interview and. Until the audience are all exhausted. So quickly and briefly, the more more than one million uh, that unofficially registered because uh, until 1995, Sudanese don't require visa or uh, residency permit. But after the attempt on uh, the former president of the war, it's like in Addis Ababa in June 1995, Egypt started putting restrictions on the residency and enter entry to Egypt on Sudanese. So however that they started to uh, record consequently that they started to apply for refugee status and as I said that Egypt is not the paradise for refugees but for the situation even despite the current challenges even for Egyptians is of course much safer than, than in Libya. So people started coming and to hope that the, uh, they will be resettled, legally resettled by UNCR by referring them to one of the uh, European or American countries to be resettled in the third third country because this is one of the three Europe solutions indicated in the 1950 Convention, which is to be legally mean, to be uh, voluntarily repatriated to go back to the country uh, if the situation changed or to be resettled in a certain country, or to be uh, locally integrated. Unfortunately, Egypt has five reservations on the 1950 Convention, one of which is uh, personal status. Egypt doesn't grant the Egyptian citizenship to refugees uh, and migrants, unfortunately. So the option of being locally integrated is very far from reality. That's why, of course, going back home is not the best option currently, especially for Iraqis and Syrians. Even in, in, in Sudan, now after the change of the regime in Sudan, as like a few months ago, so it's a newly born kind of regime. So I know that they would have in their mind the return of refugees. However, I think this is not a priority now for the, uh, the authorities, the new regime in Sudan. They have other challenges, but if they are working on the uh, Transitional justice, which is the normal kind of procedure now after the change of regime, so that they will do first legal reform and then, like doing the reform of the uh, security apparatus, and then consequently, that if the Sudanese refugees in Egypt are uh, sure that the situation changed and they have more than the diplomatic guarantees, by the way, that. If you ask any diplomat from any country that has a refugee in another country, he will say, no, 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 they are welcome to return, but this is what we call diplomatic assurance. For many Sudanese in 1998, they were turned off as some kind of diplomatic assurance by the uh, former president of uh, Sudan, Bashir, and then they were arrested upon arrival to Sudan. So the issue is something more than the option of being assured by the authorities that you will not face any kind of persecution when you return. If I want to finish myself, okay. So, but, okay, anyway, so if you guys, if you have any questions relating to the situation, which I didn't have a chance to talk. Okay, so maybe after the, uh, my colleagues finish, so thank you so much. Thank you.
financing presentations. Effectively, you have given us a definition of VG, and then you have tackled the issue of migrants in Libya uh, and the terrible situation there. This push us uh, to to ask or to call open the a member state of the African Union to make an investigation uh, to make an investigation uh, on the, the crimes committed against uh, migrants in Libya. Uh, thank you. Now I move to my my sister. Florence Watara. She's, uh, as I told you, a human rights, uh, women human rights defenders. She will be tackling the issue of IDPs. Uh, she has made a lot of mission to the Sahel, especially to IDPs and uh, uh, migrants camps. So, if I ask you, uh, in, in a new country, and especially in Niger, uh, as we know, there is a Gadez camps of, for, for, for migrants, and uh, in Mali. Can you give us an overview of the situation there? Thank you. Merci, Naji. Avant tout, pour vous, je voudrais, au nom du Mali DH, vous remercier de nous avoir associés à ce panel. Je suis Florence Ouattara de la Coalition pour qui avait des défenseurs des droits humains. Mais je suis en mission de l'ADH. Donc, au nom du coordinateur ouest africain, je vous remercie. Concernant les déplacés, je voudrais dire que le Burkina Faso n'a pas la culture de la gestion des déplacés. Nous avons connu de toutes ces pousses, mais c'est la première fois que mon pays est confronté à la gestion des déplacés. Euh, depuis des années, la partie nord a reçu les déplacés maliens parce que la crise vivienne a commencé et les déplacés maliens sont reçus par le Burkina Faso. Mais ça, c'était une gestion en concertation avec les Nations Unies. Mais à présent, il y a des déplacés internes. Les Burkinabés déplacés sur le sol Burkinabé, c'est une première et il faut reconnaître que les autorités sont prises à la gauche. Je voudrais situer d'abord le contexte en disant que c'est dès la prise de pouvoir du président Kaboré qu'il y a eu les premières attaques des djihadistes dans la capitale Ouagadou. On pensait à des simples incidents, mais plus tard, et en plus des attaques terroristes, les crises intercommunautaires ont commencé à produire les déplacés internes. Tout est parti le 31 décembre 2018 dans un village face à là-haut, où un chef traditionnel a été assassiné et les présidents coupables auraient des très peu et parlaient de tout foutre. Et ça ne suffit pour qu'il y ait une épilation ethnique de tous les peuples, surtout du sexe masculin, à partir de 12 ans et autres. Donc il y a eu plus de 200 victimes du côté de la société civile, donc on a dénombré 200 victimes, des peuples tués, jetés dans les puits de, de forces aurifères, d'autres brûlés, les habitations brûlées, les bétails brûlés et volés. Donc la situation s'est désignée, pourquoi On fait Parce qu'il n'y a pas eu de justice. De 31 décembre à nos jours, il n'y a pas eu de justice. On n'a pas pu donner une réponse ni aux victimes, ni aux européens droit. Et vous savez que l'impunité est le trésor de toutes les révoltes. Aujourd'hui, en plus des populations peuples, en fait tout le nord, le centre nord est embrassé. Nous avons plus de 300 000 déplacés internes au Burkina Faso. La capitale est envahie. Les régions du sud, du sud sont envahies. Les déplacés sont en train de rejoindre certains pays frontaliers tels que le Canada. Je vous dis que c'est un drame humanitaire. Le Burkina Faso n'est pas très riche. Le peu de ressources que nous avons aurait pu contribuer à améliorer les conditions de vie des populations. Aujourd'hui, les ressources du gouvernement vont dans l'armée. Comment gérer donc toutes ces populations Si les 300 000 il y a 80% qui sont des femmes et des enfants, puisque les hommes ont été tués. Du coup, les femmes se sont retrouvées chefs de famille. Vous savez que c'est un rôle traditionnel 
attribuée aux hommes. Mais quand une femme se retrouve avec les personnes âgées et les enfants, elle se retrouve chef de famille. Et mon regard se pointe d'abord si la femme peut. Parce que la femme peut vivre de lait, de beurre et de, de, de la volaille. C'est ça que la femme peut euh, euh, utiliser comme ressource. Les bœufs ont été tués, les bétails ont été volés. Ces femmes sans ressources, chefs de famille, comment peuvent-elles gérer les survivants Une équation aujourd'hui que nous ne pouvons pas résoudre. Comment les reconvertir Comment les faire comprendre que Burkina Faso, sur le sol Burkinabé, elles peuvent se retrouver seules face à leur destin euh, la communauté internationale est là, c'est vrai, les PTF euh, agissent. Au niveau de la société civile, nous nous organisons comme nous voulons pour la mobilisation des ressources. Mais sachez que les réfugiés sont logés en majorité dans les écoles. L'école, ce n'est pas une maison d'habitation. Du coup, avec la rentrée scolaire, les élèves sont à la porte de l'école occupés par les, les, les déplacés. Où les loger Comment faire pour que les enfants qui sont parmi les déplacés puissent jouir de leur droit à l'éducation Comment faire pour que les enfants qui ne sont pas déplacés puissent entrer dans les classes pour suivre les cours euh, La conséquence est immédiate à long terme et à court terme. Immédiatement, il faut survivre. Immédiatement, il faut l'hygiène, il faut l'eau. Mais à long terme, il va falloir les inscrire dans la dynamique du développement. Comment les faire comprendre qu'il faut continuer à se vivre, à participer au développement du Burkina Faso en étant des citoyens. Ce sont les déplacés qui n'ont pas pu produire cette année. L'agriculture, c'est quand vous êtes chez vous. Les déplacés sur un autre sol ne peuvent pas produire. Du coup, nous avons la gestion de la résilience. Comment faire pour que les, pour les intégrer désormais dans la chaîne de la production Donc cette question nous angoisse les années à venir, parce que même quand ces populations vont répartir, comment essayer de reproduire l'agriculture, s'insérer et commence à, à, à produire comme un Burkina. La deuxième conséquence, c'est l'administration Burkinabé qui, qui a fui les zones déplacées. Ça échappe totalement au contrôle à l'autorité de l'État. Le Nord, les fonctionnaires ont fui la zone. Comment gérer le peu qui reste quand vous tombez malade là-bas, vous ne pouvez pas avoir des choses parce que les gens sont faibles. sont faibles. L'administration ne résiste pas comme par le plus de justice. Donc c'est le saut qui. En fait, j'interpelle, c'est vrai mon pays, et j'interpelle la communauté internationale. Parce qu'au moment où le massacre se produisait au Burkina, le Mali aussi était en train de massacrer ses peuples. Quand la journée a fait le massacre également, on a l'impression qu'il y avait une connexion entre les États pour massacrer les peuples. Mais l'injustice commence toujours par quelqu'un qui se déporte sur les autres. Aujourd'hui, ce ne sont pas seulement les peuples. Aujourd'hui, les mots aussi déplacés dépassent les peuples déplacés. Et si on ne tire pas vite sur la sonnette d'Adam, c'est tout le Burkina qui va s'embraser. Pourquoi Parce que même les régions qui reçoivent les déplacés sont des. des c'est la pression sur les ressources humaines, l'eau, le pâturage, comment gérer les sols, l'accès aux sols. Donc il y a déjà des grincements dedans entre les résidents et les déplacés. Parce que en amont, avant de trouver des solutions en aval. Et voilà pourquoi euh, nous demandons à la société civile, au gouvernement et à la communauté internationale de faire en sorte pour que le langage, le discours politique change. Parce que les causes sont internes. Les partis politiques ne résument sur rien pour avoir le pouvoir. Il y en a qui divisent pour mieux contrôler les populations. Mais mon regard se porte également sur le pouvoir maintenant. Le pouvoir maintenant, le sous-sol du Burkina est riche, le Niger est riche, le Mali est riche. Selon les informations, le pétrole existe dans notre sous-région. L'or est là, le zinc, le, le, le charbon, le manganèse est là. Donc, je n'accuse personne, mais à qui profite le crime Qui aimerait que nos peuples se déchirent pour qu'ils puissent vendre les armes Qui produit les armes Qui produit les munitions Et à qui on vend tout ça Au Mali, il y a les dozos. Au Burkina Faso, il y a les dozos. 
En Côte d'Ivoire, il y a les dosos. La confrérie des dosos, c'est tout partout. Il y a les dogons au Mali, au Burkina, les dosos. Au Burkina, en plus, il y a les corps les groupes d'autodéfense. Tous ces milices ont des armes. Le Burkina ne produit pas des armes, le Mali encore moins que le Niger. Mais qui produit les armes, les donne à nos populations, à nos milices, à nos compagnies de sécurité privée pour embraser la sous-région En tout cas, moi j'interpelle l'Union africaine. C'est maintenant qu'il faut agir en toute sérénité, en toute souveraineté, en toute, souveraineté, en toute responsabilité. L'Afrique a longtemps souffert de la pauvreté. Aujourd'hui, l'Afrique a des ressources. Si on ne veut pas de nos enfants, mais au moins on nous garde nos peu de richesse pour qu'on puisse s'occuper de nos enfants. Parce que le chômage, il est pour quelque chose. Le sous-développement des régions déplacées, il est pour quelque chose. L'or est produit dans 13 régions du Burkina Faso. 14 compagnies étrangères exploitent l'or du Burkina Faso. Le gramme d'or coûte 25 000 francs. Mais le président Compaoré ne peut pas utiliser les ressources de l'or pour faire des écoles, les maternités, des dispensaires, pour donner des bonnes routes au Burkina Faso. L'argent de l'or est utilisé pour acheter des armes. Et vous savez très bien qui produit les armes. Qui profite de, manne, de cette manne financière du sous-sol du Burkina Faso, du Mali, du Niger À qui profite le crime Je voudrais également dire que euh, sans accuser quelqu'un, il faut reconnaître que nous avons fermé longtemps les yeux. Ce n'est pas tombé du ciel tout ça. Ça a été planifié, ça a été organisé, ça a été exécuté. Mais pourquoi est-ce que nous n'avons pas agi On accuse la Libye, mais ce n'est pas seulement la Libye. Les cœurs étaient préparés à la haine. Les cœurs étaient préparés à une exploitation honteuse de la situation des déplacés. Les cœurs étaient préparés à diviser et à entretenir la haine. Aujourd'hui, moi je pense que chacun de nous est interpellé, chacun de nous doit agir. Il est temps d'arrêter le massacre, car la vie humaine, rien ne vaut la vie humaine. Aucune raison ne peut justifier le massacre de la vie humaine. A bon entendeur, salut. Merci. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, really, uh, IDPs are facing huge challenges. The situation in the north is at the same. So here, you're right, Africa is rich of natural resources. And the population should benefit from these natural resources. So the reason behind this migration or IDPs is the lack of transparency, is corruption, is corruption that we, we undergo every day in our continent. Thank you another time for the presentation. Now I move to our last panelist, Mr. Filali. So if I ask you, Mr. Filali, what are the best practices or in other, in other sense, uh, the, uh, the durable solution to protect migrants and refugees and IDPs. Okay, so his question, you will find it inside the, the lines of my discussion. But before that, I would like to, to say something, that migration is something human. It's a human behavior. And it's yeah. Okay. I say that migration is a human behavior, it's something human us that contributes to the development of our countries and our countries. But when it becomes forced, and that's the question, when we say forced, that's when we can say it is forced, when we say that migration is forced. For me, I think that the migrants who leave their countries for to improve their economic status or social status. That's because their country didn't fulfill their obligations for them to provide them the lack of dignity and their rights. That's why they decided to leave from the first place. And yet I consider to somehow, so I consider this as a forced migration. When people they find themselves trapped between militias and armed forces and the government fighting each other, and they find themselves left to obliged to leave their homes, that's forced. Migration. That's what we call IDPs. So uh, the 
African Commission and the NGOs, international NGOs, all the international community has been calling through the years for a wave of solidarity with the IDPs and refugees around the world. And they've been calling for this. It's because it's the states who are the first responsible to provide these people with the conditions of lives that would not leave them leave their homes from the first place as I just mentioned. So it's actually putting the African countries in front of their mere reality, in front of their responsibility toward their citizens in the 21st century. So we are still sitting here and discussing conditions like corruption, education, healthcare. We should overpass this question right, right now discussing this. So, uh, and the problem of IDPs and refugees is actually a multidimensional problem from the fact that it requires so many kinds of interventions. It requires that we deal with their problem from an economical point of view, from a social point of view, and to provide psychological stability to those, I call them victims, of the absence of good governments in their home countries. So to reintegrate this, this victim, as I say, and I'm sorry for using some harsh words, I, I want to use these words so to make the problem clearly to, to you. So these victims, they need a psychological intervention to ensure their stability when they are reintegrated. And when we talk about reintegration, help we must speak about best practices and best and ideal practices, how to reintegrate those people. So from here comes the importance of having institutional and measures, policies to reintegrate those people and to find solutions to their, to their problems and to protect them when they come back and when they return home. So, I'm quite sure that you are all familiar to the statistics that say that one third of IDPs and refugees in the world are from Africa. So, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, 70 point million IDPs are in the world, and one third of them is from Africa. That's absolutely shocking to us. That we should feel ashamed of this. And uh, so many there. Sudan, South Sudan are top countries in creating this problem. Uganda, according to the statistics, is top country in receiving them with 1.2 million. So this situation is actually put us in the challenge that forced, dis forced disappearance requires that the African countries collaborate together so as to find a solution for this for this problem. Sorry, I'm trying that my intervention will be a little bit more general because from yesterday we noticed that some people are not familiar to the Kampala Convention, to, to the problem at all. So I'm just trying to. So I said that uh, forced disappearance required that the African states promote cooperation in all fields of human activities and to raise the living and the well being of their citizens, as I mentioned. Now I will pass to speak about the uh, Kampala Convention. Well, as I, mean, as I promised Naji, I will just speak generally about it, which is now 10 years old treaty since 2019. And uh, we hope so much, and we put a lot of hopes on this convention, so as it can uh, put the countries in front of their responsibilities. And we want it, and we want some countries who are still reluctant. Imagine that there are countries that are still reluctant to ratify Kampala Convention. Why? Because they think that internal displacement is an internal issue. How stupid is that? Kampala Convention gives the force to the international, sorry, to the international NGOs and civil society to enter in those states to protect those people. 
indicates that these states are not willing or they are not able to control their territory. And they say they don't want to ratify, but they still reluctant. They think that no, this is non-interference issue that you should not be well intervening in our internal issues. I find this shocking as well. And here comes one question: Why we, why the Bala Convention is important? So the Bala Convention is the most significant regional treaty that obliges African governments to protect people who are forced to leave their home because of, well, armed conflicts, because of disasters and violence or human rights violation. Kampala Convention is important because it articulates clearly and utterly all the actors related to the internal displacement and refuge. Unlike other instruments, it articulates clearly the government and the non-state actors, NGOs, AU, and when I speak about non-state actors, I'm speaking about the force, sorry, the force through the armed groups. And this arms groups and that does, does not give the legitimacy to be there from the first point. So I'm not to misunderstand what I said. So uh, most importantly, Kampala Convention it transformed what seems to be so low, as my friend mentioned, guidelines and recommendation to a harsh law and a hard law that obliges the states to stand for IDPs and refugees. So, as I say, and, and as I say in general, and I come from North Africa, and I would like to speak about the situation in India, which I'm absolutely touched with touches everybody in North Africa. So the situation in Libya needs all of us to stand up for those people who are there, the migrants who are there. They are facing all kinds of abuse, starting from sexual harassment to slavery. So they are, they are in the hands of the militia and the armed groups in Libya. And in the mafia that starts from their home countries, the mafia that starts from from every country there is a mafia who is working with the Libyan armed groups. And here we urge that everybody who is interested in this to stand up for those people and call the government to bear the responsibility towards those people who are there and we are sitting here in an air conditioned room speaking about them. People are suffering in Libya. People are used to suffer in Algeria when they used to be left in the desert with a little water and a little food to face their fate to go back to their home in the desert. And pictures, films can prove that. People are suffering in Sinai, in Egypt. And I'm speaking about the Egyptians here, who are being trapped in a fight between the government and the terrorist groups. And they are obliged to leave their, their homeland, Sinai, because of this island. And no one is speaking about this right now, right here. So, okay. uh, thank you very much, Mr. Filani, for. I say thank you very much for the useful presentation. Effectively, we have a prominent, prominent. Uh, convention, which is Kampala Convention. Uh, here, we urge the African countries to ratify and to domesticate Kampala Convention. So, thank you very much, our panelists. Not wasting time, we move to. Uh, I open the floor for questions. Yes? Cameroon remains this movement. Um, we gave some statistics on the situation of internally displaced persons in Africa. I want to corroborate them with that of Cameroon and ask a question. Uh, the, U the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Cameroon anticipated that by the end of 2019, 4,300 
407,000 Cameroonians will be internally displaced. That's 60% of those internally displaced will be women. 53% of Cameroonian refugees in Nigeria will be women, while 51 refugees will be children and 43 internally displaced uh, children as well. And my worry is for the uh, Kampala Convention and the UN guidelines on internal displacement to apply, we need to have a real data that is disaggregated according to the age and the sex of these people who are internally displaced and whether they are in school and activity in their host communities and all those things. But then, back home, it is a very sensitive issue, we have been told by government. We, of the civil society, we are not given the opportunity to conduct this research and obtain this data that is needed for effective intervention to assist and prevent these people. My worry is how do we persuade government to give us the permission to collect this data and disaggregate as I have just said. Thank you. E falar sobre esses outros. Questão muito importante tem a ver com a questão de refugiados. Antes de mais, eu sou o Quintino Loren, da Guiné-Bissau. Pertenço à rede de jovens da Guiné-Bissau. Uh, para falar disso, questão de refugiados, uh, para mim é uma situação muito, muito complicada, ou seja, muito preocupante. Porque no meu país, quando estamos a fazer um trabalho, um inquérito para registrar pessoas com vocês como refugiados, o que é que nós constatamos? Porque há muitos refugiados que fizeram 20 anos, 30 anos, sem ter, ou seja, sem ter documentos. Para nós isso é complicado. Decidimos trabalhar juntamente com o governo e Comissão Especializada para Assuntos de Refugiados e também com o Gabinete da Nação Unida para Refugiados. Uh, no ano passado, o Governo uh, atribuiu mais de 150 refugiados de documento. Para nós, uh, isso é um passo, é um passo dado. Outra questão que eu tenho tem a ver, tem a ver com a questão da migração irregular, porque muitos são jovens. Agora, eu quero saber qual é a política que os Estados africanos estão a fazer para reduzir a questão da, da migração irregular, porque muitos são jovens. Então, para nós é preocupante esta questão. Muito obrigado. Bonjour, eu sou Michel Bouba. Je suis bien de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, précisément de la Côte d'Ivoire. Je travaille à Alliance Côte d'Ivoire. Je remercie. Ça ne passe pas. Bonjour, je suis Michel Gouvard. Je viens de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, précisément de la Côte d'Ivoire. Je travaille sur le de l'Alliance Côte d'Ivoire. Je remercie les panélistes pour leur pertinente intervention. Et vu toutes ces présentations qu'ils ont faites, je vais vous poser une question. De compte la discussion sur les problèmes de réfugiés, qui, quand on regarde ce qui se passe, est devenu un problème général au niveau de l'Afrique. Ce n'est plus un problème de l'Afrique du Nord, de l'Afrique saharienne, mais c'est un problème qui touche vraiment toute l'Afrique dans sa généralité. Je me pose un peu la question de la pertinence de, du travail de nos organisations, aussi bien au niveau mental, au niveau international, au niveau sous-régional, que je pense qu'il est temps que ces différentes organisations-là remettent un peu en cause leur stratégie, qu'ils prennent les devants et qu'ils acceptent que les organisations, la société civile, puissent jouer véritablement leur rôle pour que nous puissions avoir des résultats, pour que nous puissions anticiper sur euh, ces, 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 ces conflits qui présagent à, à, à l'horizon. 
vient dans son intervention de résolution qui avait été proposée par le présentateur, il avait parlé de prévention. Et je pense qu'il est maintenant temps que l'Union africaine, mais également toutes les organisations de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et autres, puissent mettre en place des stratégies assez agressives que dans le système d'intervention, pour qu'on puisse avoir des solutions qui vont permettre de pacifier totalement le continent. Thank you, uh, my name is Elijah, and I have a question for Mr. Christopher Bellard. He said about the people who are sending from the refugees in the country. Is this one of the sending from Sudan or from Sudan or from the North or South Sudan? Because there are two states, not twenty states. Also, we have a human, well, Sudan has a human of, of, of Egypt with five freedoms, one of these freedoms. For what freedom, 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 freedom of movement. Consider, uh, according to this is an event, who consider the Egyptian, not the Egyptians, but the Egyptians.
Troisièmement, je me ravis, monsieur le, 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 le président, du fait qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons la possibilité de discuter nos problèmes, de voir nos problèmes, et il faut que nous voyons nos problèmes en face. Et je me réjouis également, monsieur le président, de l'élection de mon pays, la Mauritanie, hier, comme membre du Conseil de droits de l'homme des Nations Unies, au niveau de l'honneur, avec 172 voix. Par rapport au, au suffrage exprimé, ce sont des centres de droits Et je pense que l'élection de la Mauritanie au niveau du Conseil des droits de l'homme contribue largement dans le cadre de la clarification de la situation au niveau de l'Est africaine, au niveau de notre zone et au niveau de toutes les questions pendant au niveau de mon pays. Je vous remercie. They take benefit of the uh, family reunification kind of uh, process so that they can bring them from their home to follow their children. So if you put your child in danger to, to be under the mercy of smugglers and human traffickers, you don't know what's 
go home. I think this is should be there should be a stand with this. But normally the right to migration is is, is a, a human rights in a way that even in my country when people who are trying to do irregular migration if they're arrested, of course they're kept in detention for under admin detention, but there is no specific uh, punishment. There is no sanction against them if they want to just leave put the uh, the smuggler under trial. Uh, so just don't worry that uh, the EU is is, having, is putting lots of focus on North Africa because this is where people depart. Otherwise, they will face like one billion two hundred million Africans, disparate Africans, who want to go to Europe. So they are just trying to improve the situation of people in North Africa. So many of the North African presidents just that in their negotiations with the EU say that okay, we can improve the situation in our country so that these disparate people will not think of crossing the Mediterranean to bother you there. Second question with uh, Ms. Maha, thank you. Mrs. Maha, thank you so much. Of course, when I talk about Sudanese, I'm talking about the time when they arrived. They were all Sudanese. So forgive me, I'm not gonna be more unionist than you. So considering them all refugees, all Sudanese. However, the total rep uh, population of southern Sudanese in Egypt, refugees and non-refugees, are only 15,000, according to, the, to a discussion with the uh, consul of the southern Sudanese embassy in Egypt, Ashraf Akashan. I met him personally when he gave me this comment. Uh, so with regards to the uh, Four Freedoms Agreement, it was signed uh, between Egypt and Sudan in 2004 after reconciliation between both regimes, and it includes the Four Freedoms, are freedom of uh, visa, uh, entry, freedom for uh, residency, work, and um, and ownership. These are the four freedoms. However, since the the issue of Darfur, give me half a minute, uh, raised in 2003 and, uh, and exploded in 2004, and because both regimes needed each other, so the the Sudanese regime under uh, Bashir asked the Egyptian regime under Mubarak to suspend the, the, the convention or this bilateral agreement from the Egyptian side. So me as an Egyptian, I will go to Sudan without visa, without residency, I don't need residency permit, I can have ownership, I can work for free it, with the full implementation of the Four Freedoms Agreement. But for Sudanese, to minimize the number of Sudanese refugees coming to Egypt in order to be utilized or used as a political kind of tool to say that, see, the number of refugees from Sudan is decreasing so that there is no big issue in Darfur. So it's politicized and it was suspended from the Egyptian side upon request from the Sudanese region. Thank you. This is the floor, please. Two minutes. Merci. Je crois que c'est ma soeur Aminetou qui s'est adressée à moi et par rapport au problème que la sous-région et non seulement au Kina, au Mali, ou à Nino, ou quelque part. Le problème peut étant quelque chose qui nous interpelle au niveau euh, sous-régional et même international. Nous devons effectivement, de façon concertée, voir comment et, en fait euh, éliminer tout ce qui est discrimination, stigmatisation. Comme je l'ai dit, aujourd'hui ce sont les peuples de l'Est, ça peut être euh, et, et un autre groupe. Au niveau de la société civile, euh, ce ne sont pas seulement les ONC qui luttent. Je pense que la pression sociale a une couleur euh, multiple et nous étions tous dans la rue pour interpeller l'autorité afin d'agir et, et que justice soit faite pour les peuples. Donc il y a les Moussi, il y a les Bobo, il y a les peuples, mais nous sommes en rang serré euh, de façon euh, groupée pour aller. Notre problème aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas seulement euh, comment lutter pour les peuples, mais comment aller ensemble, à le vivre ensemble, la cohésion ensemble. Et comment est-ce qu'un peuple peut et, et les populations peuvent s'accepter euh, avec les ethnies différentes, la langue différente, la culture différente, mais surtout comment dans la perspective de 2020, envers les citoyens, les, les déplacés doivent être sur les listes et les, la liste électorale et aller voter et aller euh, être un, un candidat. Voilà comment on peut rappeler quelqu'un dans la citoyenneté. Merci. Thank you, Florence. Uh, Mr. Pilari, one minute. Okay, just I would like to comment on a, on a question talking about statistics. In the case of IDPs and refugees, is, is it this same? Okay? Because as I know, some refugee camps, they, they do not give the real, stati real statistics. Because they want more funds from Europe, but they never tell us. Um, they exaggerate the numbers. And some other countries, 
they try not to give the real members because not to not to show themselves yeah, as negative actors in that. In other words, Kanan is only maintaining friends. Of what he said, I think that the government is doing a good job in showing what they have done good. But we hope that we, as NGOs, we should stress, stress governments to do better and to do more, even though they do good. It's never good enough for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, can you give a round of applause to our panelists? So, thank you, thank you very much. On behalf of the panelists, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving us the opportunity to tackle this issue, important issue, the protection of IDPs, migrants, and refugees. The battle continue. We should work together. And there should be measures to protect IDPs, migrants, and refugees, especially vulnerable categories, that is, children and women. I thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to be exhausted because the plan is just to present this uh, framework to uh, the uh, floor. And um, the plan again is to circulate the framework through uh, uh, the organizers of this forum so that um, you, the CSOs, can then send in your input and we will have it. But I'm just going to give you a skeletal um, overview of what so far from all of these consultations we have had is in the framework and hoping that it will stoke your interest. And let me say something about this, uh, about this process. It's important that when people come to you guys and say we're developing a document that you really, really look into that document and see, make sure that your imprint is on that document. It's very important. People say, people might be jaded and say, oh, there are so many policies and documents that have been uh, produced, but what is the um, essence of it? What you lose by that kind of mindset is that you fail to have the opportunity to have your imprint on it. So, if when and when that uh, uh, document is then operationalized, uh, not only have you lost the opportunity to have the imprint, you're only going to implement what does not resonate with you. So it's important that as you listen to, to this presentation and as you get the opportunity to make your input into this uh, framework, knowing that this is a framework that's going to guide uh, the United Nations and the African Union on work on human rights in the continent, that you really are invested in the process. So, um, the outline so far looks at the background. Uh, it looks at the background. The outline of the joint framework looks at the background. We, it looks at the mandate of both institutions. It also references uh, um, certain acts of both institutions, the African Charter on the Human and People's Rights, the UN Charter, UDHR, um, uh, several uh, 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 several treaty, uh, treaties, other core AU and UN human rights treaties, as well as decisions of AU and UN legislative bodies, including resolutions of regional arrangements. It references uh, the African and UN human rights system, and it makes reference to Agenda 2063 and the, the, the whole idea behind the Africa we want and Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. And then it references to the two joint communiques arising out of, uh, it references, references the joint communique number one, arising out of a high level dialogue on human rights that was held with the African Union um, and the UN in 2017 or 18. And then, like John has said, Ample reference is going to be made to the AU 10 year action plan on human and people's rights. I hope that the CSOs here are abreast with that uh, 10, year, 10 year human rights action uh, plan. I myself was present in Wagadulu where there was consultation with CSOs, including uh, media and uh, uh, women's uh, uh, rights groups and youth. So if you don't have that document, maybe you want to approach John. Give him your email to send the uh, 10 year human rights action plan when the validation is also you are pressed with it. Then the other is to look at the rationale for cooperation. Why, why the cooperation? We looked at shared objectives between the two institutions, 
comparative advantages, complementarities, achievements recorded in the past years on partnership at the national and regional levels, and the mutual reinforcing nature of cooperation between the two institutions. So, and then the third part of it is looked at, and it's going to look at the next of the human rights and the other two uh, AU UN framework that exists. As John has already told you, the United Nations and the African Union has signed two framework uh, agreements, one on peace and security and one on development. And uh, the, what, the, what, the first word and the, and, the, and the plan of action for within the UN, at least as I speak for the UN, is to make sure that there is a nexus, a connection between all of these frameworks so we are not running in silos because we know that human rights speaks to development, development speaks to human rights, human rights speaks to uh, 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 peace and security, and peace and security speaks to human rights. So we want to uh, eliminate any uh, 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 duplication, um, emphasize the complementarity so that we know who is better placed to do what and, uh, and also make sure that we um, uh, assign res the responsibilities to whoever is most suited and, and, and make sure that the three contributes to generally the Africa we want. So um, we will be looking at convergences between the two existing frameworks and the framework of human rights. We'll also be looking at the application of human rights standards and principles to strengthen the outcomes of the two existing frameworks. And then we hope that this framework also will help facilitate joint actions between the two institutions at all times. At all times. So we're not looking at human rights after the fact, like I said yesterday. We're looking at whether in conflict, transition, post-conflict, development, whatever stage Africa is on, or whatever stage countries in Africa, or regions in Africa is on, this framework should be able to speak to the uh, promotion and protection of human rights in that situation. The objective of this framework, the overarching objective is to enhance respect for promotion and protection of human rights, including implementation of AU Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is really what we want. If we are not, uh, what we're saying is whatever it is on human rights, civil and political rights, economic, social, cultural rights, they should all speak to the development of an Africa where every respect for human, for, for human rights, promotion, protection for human rights rules the day and contributes to a, a peaceable society, a society that can develop and speak to the aspirations of the people. So specific objectives under the overarching objective is to strengthen partnership within the UN and AU on promotion and protection of human rights in Africa, to promote comparative advantages and complementarities between the two institutions that I spoke to before, create an enabling environment for peace, security, governance, and development, combat impunity, to combat impunity as part of prevention of violent conflict and disruptive crisis, and also as a deterrent to committing of human rights violations. The principles that are going to govern the partnership is, we're going to, we've already mentioned some of the regional arrangements, the UN Charter, resolution, the EU Charter, mutual respect, because we believe that Africa has something to offer the world, and in, 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 in their vision has something to offer the UN, and that the UN has something to offer Africa. Uh, inclusiveness and ownership is important. This is why we're talking to all these, uh, all these communities, like you today, the CSO, like John said, the National Human Rights Institutions, like the regional economic communities. That's why we're talking to everybody. We want a sense of inclusiveness and ownership of this framework. Because human rights speaks to the dignity of the person. It's not of the institution, it's of the person. And the person in question here are the African people. So we want inclusiveness and ownership of this framework and the process. Um, transparency and accountability. Uh, I've already talked about complementarity and comparative advantages. Um, com uh, uh, but let okay, now, the last one, solidarity and joint action, including fundraising and implementation of the program. Let me say something about complementarity and comparative advantage. It's not only between the UN and the AU, it's also for you, the CSOs. 
where who is best suited to do what? There are some things the African Union is best suited to do. There are some things that the African Union Commission is best suited to do. There are some things these organs that have human rights mandate is best suited to do. And there are some things national human rights institutions are best suited to do. And there are some things that civil society is best suited to do. So complementarity and comparative advantages run through the entire spirit and intent of this framework. This, then the, the, the other one is the strategy. Um, we are hoping that the framework, when fully developed, will, uh, will be implemented in the spirit of fostering cross pillar collaboration. I've already talked about it. Cross pillar collaboration in terms of the development, peace, and security, and human rights. Um, raise awareness on the framework, taking into account the local context at all times. You know, um, the local context is important. Carry out advocacy with key stakeholders, member states, REDS, NHRI, CSO, on the framework and as implementation. That's the strategy for the uh, framework. The main theme of the framework is enhancing respect, promotion, and protection of human rights, all human rights. In my convention, some decisions with UDHR, all. So it will look into issues about technical assistance and um, accountability um, and prevention. Like I said yesterday, you know, there's an evolution in the thought process of what human rights should be doing. We should no longer be the human rights that waits for violations to occur. Then we go and document the violations and we call for accountability. We could be both. We could be the human rights that raises issues raises concerns before they occur. You see trends and patterns, you have facts, you have figures, you have irrefutable facts of things that are about to happen that will destabilize the country from a human rights perspective, then you should, we should be that human rights that raises that, that uh, concern. And that is the whole idea behind prevention. And in, all, in any area, maybe it is a uh, um, uh, a civil and political, maybe it's economic, social, maybe it's in disability, maybe it's in women's rights, maybe it's in child rights, maybe it's in unconvention against torture, maybe on uh, 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 elimination of racial discrimination, or rights of migrant workers and their families, whatever it is. We should be the human rights that is now proactive. We should be thinking and like doing our work in the sense of trying to look at how we do our work from the perspective of raising concerns. How do we, as CSOs, bring to the fore, to the government, what is happening? It should be local, it should be regional, it could be local, regional, or national. But we need to start raising those concerns. There are countries that are going to go through elections. What are you seeing in terms of trends and patterns? Um, not only for uh, uh, wait, not only for us to wait and then we say we have situation that are monitoring the violation during the elections, but what did we do before that? So prevention is a central tenet. We now need to be um, a, 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 a step ahead of uh, the situation that we see that can cost, contribute to uh, the stabilization of the continent. Um, uh, so, um, and also we're looking at the impact of human rights on peace, security, governance, and development. It will be captured in the framework. Cross cutting issues then in this framework will be sustaining peace. We want peace in this society. This is actually the tenet of human rights. And eventually, this is the realization of what we talk about when we say promotion and protection and respect for human rights. It is for us to live in peaceable societies in the so prevent sustaining this and, uh, um, will be a cross cutting issue. Agenda 2030, Agenda 2063 um, will be cross cutting issues. Climate change, climate change is a huge problem in our continent, particularly um, for those from, uh, for, for everybody. But already we're seeing what it is doing in Southern Africa, places like Mozambique. Um, we know what cyclone in that did. Um, also for small island nations, Seychelles, Mauritius, uh, and uh, Seychelles, uh, Mauritius, yes, Madagascar, all those people will see what climate change is doing to them, and the environment, of course, gender, cross cutting all the time. Um, countering violence, extremism, and terrorism, which is a prevalent uh, problem for us in the Sahel and in other parts of Africa. 
um, early warning, early action. We should, early warning and early action should be our mantra going forward. We just don't want them to arrest, uh, uh, arrest journalists, or arrest human rights defenders. Then we say, oh, they have been arrested. When there are laws that are enacted in your country that already you can see the potential that this will be exploited for X, Y, Z, like the, the lady from uh, um, DRC said yesterday. Now, this is the time to start early warning and early action. Scenario, uh, scenario uh, uh, um, forecasting. What are the possibilities? And then you raise your voice and you, you make sure that you know there is a momentum behind what you're doing. So you don't wait for them to enact the law and then people are arrested. Then we start calling for their release. We should be looking after ourselves as human rights defenders. We should be shouting before the event occurs. Um, good governance. Good governance across the business and human rights, with law, transition and justice, support to vulnerable groups, um, children, youth, women, the elderly, persons with disabilities, persons with albinism, internally displaced persons, refugees, returnees, people on the move for any reason. Now, indeed, we are also hoping in the framework that cooperation between the AU and UN bodies and mechanisms will be enhanced. There's already such. Uh, cooperation with the government with human rights mandate. There's already the Addis Ababa roadmap with the uh, African Commission on Human and People's Rights. We're also hoping um, we can uh, uh, enhance cooperation with the court, with the Committee of Experts on Rights and Welfare of the Child, with the Parliament, with the Advisory Board on Corruption, and whatever other uh, institution the AU has that has human rights mandate. Including references to the MOUs we have with the African Union Commission, with the Commission on Human and People's Rights, with the courts, with the African Peer Review Mechanism, and all. We're also hoping there will be cooperation between, uh, in this framework, with uh, the AU Peace and Security Architecture and the AU Governance Architecture, AFSA and other mechanisms. Cop uh, yeah, cooperation with human rights mechanisms like the Human Rights Council, special procedures. Um, to body special mandates, universal periodic reviews, which all African countries on that one, every country in the world of that one. Cooperation with regional economic communities and regional mechanisms, there are RX and then there are mechanisms. Cooperation with the network of African national human rights institutions and having cooperation with CSOs and think tanks. The implementation mechanism and processes of the framework and the stage will be based on subsidiarity actions and decisions to be, to be taken at the most appropriate level to encourage national and local level ownership in order to provide effective response. Um, there, somebody was talking to me yesterday, I don't know whether it's in the hall here, and he says, you, the you, what are you doing about land grabbing in Ethiopia? And I'm like, okay, what, what does Ethiopia do about land grabbing? I've been in Ethiopia. I haven't had any discussion at the Ethiopia level of land grabbing. What is going on? Have you talked to the government? Have you talked to the National Human Rights Institution? Do you have a coalition that's working on this? Do you have data? At least you should start somewhere before. If you then exhaust local remedies, then you can begin to look for other uh, avenues like the UN or the AU mechanisms. But uh, the, the, the idea behind subsidiarity is to find where action can be most effective and at what level it can be most effective. Um, there will be help to really join discussions with relevant experts and practitioners, AU organs, red senators, and CSOs. But we hope that there will be participation in the AU UN annual conference. We hope um, that this will, we will see how it will be reviewed to incorporate. Uh, maybe participation of uh, uh, CSOs. Um, we will hold annual AU and dialogue in human rights at principal and technical levels. We already agreed that we will continue to do that. And then we will participate in so many of the weather is less, less reviewed, you know, RCMs or high level dialogues. Um, we will have AU UN joint actions, including human and financial resources and joint activity, monitoring, evaluation, and reporting mechanisms, including certain appropriate benchmarks to be part of the means to which this work will be implemented. Um, just to conclude to say that the implementation will not duplicate other frameworks. Because wherever there is duplication, it will be removed. The whole idea is to support other frameworks for effectiveness. It's not to 
duplicate what other frameworks are already doing. This, this, this uh, uh, framework will not do that. And, uh, and then uh, to retreat uh, the two institutions will commit to the promotion and protection of human rights, human and people's rights, including the African decade of human and people's rights. And um, that's it. As I said earlier, I know that running through this would not, uh, uh, without you people being in uh, possession of some document to not be uh, uh, on the forum. And then uh, you can also go and consult other CSOs that are not here in your country. It doesn't have to be your CSO perspective. Maybe it's better if it is the CSO perspective from the country. And then you can make people see you think there are things you have missed out in your framework of things that are vital and important then you can get the information back to us. There will be a deadline when we send out this document and, and the, uh, the hope is that the deadline will be respected so that we can incorporate your opinion. Your opinion is extremely vital. It is extremely vital and we want to uh, hear your opinion. Yeah, when you get the email, you would also know where you send the inputs to. Um, we, will, we will circulate and discuss whether you send it direct to the African Union or you will send it to the angel from for, for them to come on us. Uh, we will send the, the email will come with where you will send your inputs to. But um, I don't know how many minutes we have left, Mr. Mont I don't know how many minutes we have left until I see the moderator. Oh, we have 15 minutes left. So we can take one or two questions from the crowd, if you have any at this point. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Saeed Ismail from Nigeria. Um, I'm listening to the information about the draft framework, um, but I have a question. Um, is it uh, limited to the similarities between the EU and the UN alone? Uh, in, uh, what about the differences between the EU and the, and, and the, and the UN? So that's my question, and I, I'm just hoping because I did not hear anything about respect for potential realities and, and, and diversity. How we can also consider including uh, that. But these are basically my two questions in terms of whether the students limited to similarities or does it also consider differences between the EU and the UN? Thank you. Colin Lamont de la CIA 4. Merci pour euh, cette euh, présentation. Euh, je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir tout à fait bien compris, mais euh, je me demande pourquoi, en amont de cette euh, rencontre, où vous avez l'occasion d'avoir toutes les ONG euh, africaines, ou quasiment toutes les ONG, on n'a pas eu en amont euh, ce, ce projet de test qui va être signé. Euh, c'est un an, comme vous le dites, euh, dans la première euh, semaine de décembre. Euh, je me demande si, euh, dans le cadre de cette coopération qui, avec les OSC, de, à quel moment on a pu avoir, ne serait-ce qu'au niveau euh, national, des rencontres pour commencer à porter nos contributions. Euh, les contributions que vous nous demandez maintenant, Est-ce que ce ne sera pas pour véritablement vous accompagner parce qu'on n'aura pas eu suffisamment de temps pour pouvoir euh, travailler sur un test aussi important Alors là, euh, c'est vraiment un peu mes, mes inquiétudes parce que même pour l'élaboration de la décennie de, de, de plan d'action pour l'Afrique relativement aux droits de l'homme, les OSC n'ont pas été consultés au niveau des États, au niveau de l'Union africaine. Et bon, en fait, je constate que. Il faut qu'on puisse vraiment euh, retravailler ce cadre de rencontre-là et que nous puissions apporter véritablement nos contributions. Sinon, c'est une série que vous accompagnez. Merci. Good morning, my name is Lydia Wittek from Platform for the Bachelor of Uganda. My question is one, how is this, does it have on countries? For example, uh, is bringing together and saying that all the different human rights and the different human rights institutions and conventions that have been uh, you know, put in place uh, 
in terms of implementation there in this particular framework, but you also realize that there are certain countries, either one, that have not ratified certain human rights institutions, but also there are those that have ratified with the reservations. How is the implementation of this particular framework going to, uh, how, is, how are they taking into consideration this particular aspect, the reservation, but also uh, those that have not ratified certain human rights institutions also? Yes, you, have, uh, you are texting us that we go back to the, our national or the different countries to try to do consultations. But I think uh, it could have also been good if you had actually taxed the national human rights uh, institutions to do the consultative uh, meetings within the different countries. Thank you. Uh, I'm Karim Kanezana Julia. I'm the director of Africa. Um, avec Human Rights Watch. Et ma question euh, est portée sur les mesures de contrainte que vous auriez prévues. Euh, parce que nous avons, un, vous avez parlé d'un cadre, euh, d'un partenariat entre les Nations Unies et l'Union Africaine, initiative qu'on a euh, Mais Je me pose la question. Euh, quelles sont les mesures de contrainte Et c'est une question qui est... Qui, qui, je rebondis un petit peu sur ce que ma soeur de Luganda vient de dire. Euh, les, différents, les, différentes, euh, euh, les différentes actions de certains pays, qui, soit n'ont pas ratifié, soit même qui, après avoir ratifié, ne respectent pas leurs obligations internationales. Quelles sont les mesures de contrainte C'est la première question. La deuxième question, quelles sont les mesures d'appui euh, par rapport aux organes, aux institutions régionales qui existent déjà, notamment la Commission africaine Est-ce que, est que ça fait partie de ce cadre, de ce partenariat Merci. 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 You know, to make input into it and send it to us uh, for consideration. Now, somebody asked that, uh, talk about the 10 years human rights action plan that was not, uh, you know, the, the consultation was not there, the civil society was not consulted. Uh, some of you that are in this room will be a witness with us that uh, we had several consultations with the civil society organization. The challenge is that. It is very difficult for all the civil society practitioners to be invited to this type of consultation. And that is where the responsibility also lies on the representative of the civil society that participated in the previous consultation to disseminate and also, you know, consult with others so that we can have a more robust uh, dissemination. But however, the member state will also be doing a consult, the final validation of that particular document. And we are going to have a representative from all the 55 member states uh, to finalize uh, the 10 years human rights action plan. Now, with regards to what kind of binding force will it have, this is a joint framework. What it's going to do is that it's going to reinforce the different human rights instruments, you know, that has binding force. And that is the reason why we are talking to different stakeholders, the civil society, the, 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 the national human rights institutions and the uh, United Nations and also the African Union. We are going to combine force to see how we can use that joint framework to put a binding force on the different instruments that member states have ratified. Uh, now, with regard to tasking national human rights institutions to do national consultation, at time, you know, the, the international organization like the UN, the African Union, also has its own limitation, particularly in time of financial resources. It is going to be very difficult for us to embark on this type of consultation at all levels. But what we have done is to bring the network of African national human rights institutions together and we presented the documents to them so that they can also use that opportunity to consult within their own network and also at the national level so that they can also make input into the draft uh, framework. Uh, finally, uh, our sister from the Human Rights Watch talked about the coercive uh, measure. What are the measures? Well, you see, at times there are different types of measures in place. Like, for example, 
We have seen the African Union, for example, suspending some of its member states as a result of gross human rights violation or not doing one thing in line with the African Union ways. So, and the essence of why we are having this type of consultation is that when they talk about uh, comparative advantages, the civil society has its own advantages. There are some things that the civil society can do that the African Union cannot do. There are some things that the African Union can do that the United Nations cannot do. And so the essence of this type of presentation is for all of us to think together, look at the document, and also bring to be the type of comparative advantage that we all have, so that at the end of the day, the promotion and protection of women and people's rights can be accomplished as a shrine in our different human rights history. I think I will just hand over to this. Thank you, John. I think John uh, answers all the questions that have been presented. I just, I just want to add again. When we send this to you, a, we have, we are just starting, and what we are doing is to make sure we consult all the stakeholders. There are no actual texts that have been inputted into the joint framework. So, because we're starting, you will have the opportunity to also make your own input, shape the joint framework the way you think it responds to the issue of protection and promotion of human rights in the continent. Let me end by saying that the power of civil society is that you speak for the people. Similarly, that's what it's supposed to be. So, um, when it comes to um, coercion, for, for uh, 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 compliance with uh, human rights instruments, ratified or existing. I don't see any better person, any better sense of persons placed to make sure that this, uh, uh, that countries uh, discharge their, uh, their responsibilities as to generous than civil society. It is the niche that you occupy, you are the voice of the people. So we and you working together, you actually have a greater opportunity to say this is what our people want to your various governments. So ensuring that governments discharge their responsibilities when they ratify instruments, while we will support them, work with them, urge them, you also have the uh, 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 bigger space to ensure that your government is doing what they have not taken to do on your behalf. So let me end uh, here. Like I said, we will circulate this document. We will hope that you can uh, make inputs into And uh, let's hope that the voice of the CSOs are heard in the joint in the UN framework that's eventually produced. Thank you. Merci. Uh, Nous allons suspendre pour 15 minutes, pour une pause café de 15 minutes. Après, avec le panel, sur la pertinence du projet de plan d'action et de mise en œuvre des de, de, de droits de l'homme et des peuples en Afrique. Par rapport au thème, c'est l'Union. Donc, nous allons suspendre 15 minutes pour et revenir. Euh, Good afternoon. My name is Anne Hazel and I'm from the Southern African Nationality Network and I wanted to just introduce us to all of you, for those of you who think that statistics is a specialist field that you don't want to dip your feet in, I want to encourage you that nationality rights are cross-cutting across all of your issues and if you want us to support you in most countries in Africa so we can support you. Um, what I want to just mention about what Chesel said about gender is that we all know, and many of you here are gender activists and gender equality activists, that uh, there is no future for Africa in terms of peace and development if we do not empower women to be free. <laughs> and so the key to that is to make sure that women have full access to nationality, which means that they will have access to civil political rights and socio-economic rights, and that's what we want. So we want to call on all the gender equality activists here 
please work together with us. We are a family of activists right across the world and um, we would like to empower women by making sure that they have the first right which is nationality, which leads to all other rights. Um, so please join us. We are here for the conference and we are all over Africa. So we want to support you. Thank you. Merci. Alors, euh, ma préoccupation porte sur le projet de protocole sur euh, la patrie. Je voudrais euh, savoir à quel niveau se situe actuellement euh, le, ce protocole dans le processus d'adoption. Quelle est la procédure suivie Et je pose cette question parce que relativement au projet de protocole additionnel de, à la charte africaine des droits de l'homme et du peuple, visant au lit d'appel de mort, il y a des difficultés à ce que le, ce projet atterrisse sur la table de chef. Merci. Merci. Je voudrais des personnes qui sont dans le besoin de la nationalité de l'État civil et qui sont considérées à partir. Donc, je donne l'exemple dans mon pays, la Mauritanie. Et donc, les répatriés mauritaniens qui sont revenus du Sénégal, et qui sont aujourd'hui dans des villages et qui n'ont pas d'accès ni à l'état civil pour éviter leurs enfants et pour même sortir du village et travailler. Donc, c'est le village de Tamber. Nous avons aussi une autre catégorie, c'est des personnes, c'est des enfants qui naissent au mariage ou des enfants abandonnés. Donc, ces enfants n'ont pas la chance d'avoir l'état civil ni avoir la nationalité. Plusieurs autres catégories qui sont très importantes aussi au niveau de la société, c'est les migrants qui migrent pendant une trentaine d'années en Mauritanie, dont les enfants naissent dans le territoire mauritanien et qui les enfants n'ont pas l'accès à l'état civil, ce qui met en obstacle leur éducation. Donc, je, en ce qui concerne l'aspect genre, je voudrais un peu dire que la femme africaine ou la femme des pays des manières rares, les femmes qui ont le droit de donner la nationalité à leurs enfants, et même la femme des femmes. Donc le droit à la femme de donner la nationalité à ses enfants qui sont nés dans le mariage avec un étranger ou qui sont nés à l'étranger dans le père étranger. Donc ça c'est une situation qui se pose aujourd'hui. C'est une situation aujourd'hui de toutes les femmes mauritaniennes qui sont mariées avec les étrangers qui n'ont pas le droit de donner à la, la nationalité à leurs enfants. Un autre problème qui s'ajoute à cela, c'est que la femme n'a pas le droit chez nous d'inscrire ses enfants à l'état civil. C'est l'homme seul qui détient le droit d'inscrire ses enfants à l'état civil. Et ça, c'est un obstacle aujourd'hui et c'est une discrimination flagrante à l'état civil. Donc, est-ce que tous ces, toutes ces catégories de personnes peuvent être intégrées dans ce contexte de ce genre d'action que vous avez fait Merci. Oh, um, uh, ethnicity. And therefore, it means that a child who belongs to a minority uh, ethnic group that is not recognized in the third schedule of the Ugandan constitution. That child, right now they speak, they are standing at risk of not actually being able to sit for national examinations or even perhaps at some point, with time to come, it will be that they will not even be able to access uh, other social services or medical services. Because under the constitution, you have to register. And for a child to register in the national identification, their parents must be already registered. And therefore, the people who are coming from these minority groups are not able to register. So the child can also not be able to register and therefore they cannot even sit for national examinations. So with time to come, we are going to have a generation of uh, people that are not recognized. And I think it's important for Uganda, one, to ensure that no child is born stateless, as opposed to uh, basing the citizenship to, uh, to the uh, ethnic group. Perhaps it should be based on uh, birth. If I'm born in Uganda, then why not uh, be a citizen of that country? And I also think uh, that laws that uh, really outlaw dual citizenship for children should also be dealt with at different uh, 
national level, or perhaps also with the draft um, uh, the AU uh, uh, protocol. So, yeah, thank you. We will present this issue. My question uh, is concerning uh, bodies that lie in the motions um, of uh, many people who become stateless and generally identified by their relatives or families about the language. Is that covered? Is this a means uh, that's covered uh, in the people in their case study or experience, something for search? Les décisions de ces mécanismes judiciaires ou casier judiciaire. Merci. Et il serait bon que cette question peut-être non perçue puisse être euh, vue et euh, réversée dans le cadre de l'examen du projet en cours. Je vous remercie. The unity are, I mean, the, sorry, the AU has pledged the unity are, um, that um, for their support of it. Um, so that's what we have so far. Um, and so now um, the AU is also now trying to get states to um, to, to adopt it, at least by 2020, uh, which is where, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, that's where the NGO sector comes in, that uh, we need. Um, NGOs that will now advocate towards um, the adoption in their respective states um, of the draft protocol. Um, and um, moving on to that one, I'm going to move on to the next one, which was. Yeah, um, there was a, um, a birth registration and ID issue, and um, I think um, there's a woman in the back there who asked that question. Um, so, I mean, part of the, 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 the issue is getting um, the civil society space um, you know, basically interested in the type, this type of work because, um, as Lizo mentioned earlier, that before you can access any right, um, you know, you have to have something on paper with a name, uh, with your name on it. Um, so, meaning a birth certificate or an identification document. Um, so, like in that instance, um, what we are trying to do is get NGO, the NGO sector more involved, um, and particularly even corporates, um, where they have pro departments, in offering direct legal services in our respective states, um, where there is um, where, where there is a need. Um, so I think she mentioned Mauritania, um, and I think again it goes back to now trying to find um, within your region or within um, your your. Your, your respective countries, let's say, try to find um, what, which organizations uh, are particularly deal with, uh, with documentation and um, ultimately perhaps even um, resorted to litigation with regards to that. Um, so, yeah, um, that that's it as well. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. Thank you very much, Chair. I think a lot of the comments and questions have actually reinforced themselves. And I really like that Lizzo from Lawyers for Human Rights began by reminding us that the right to nationality is a primary right, without which, if you don't have it, you are not able to enjoy your other civil, political, economic, social, cultural, or group rights. 
because you're not recognized by the state in which you find yourself. So I think that importance has really been made and maybe we'll just also share. I know you have like your websites and so on for the coalition where you have a lot of information which colleagues can follow up on even after the meeting. And I think that's why for me it is very important that one of the key strategic objectives of the draft action and implementation plan as it currently exists is to ratify, domesticate, harmonize, and implement the shared values instruments of the African Union, which means also its key charters on human and people's rights and their protocols. So I think really it's about how we revisit the campaigns we currently have for ratification of these key instruments, and we revisit how we engage the political organs of the African Union. You know, as self was so say, uh, the work on the protocol was done, the technical work has been done. It's about finding time to put it on the schedule of our policy organs, which is the heads of state, the summit, and below them, the Council of Ministers, which is our Ministers for Foreign Affairs, African Affairs, and International Cooperation. So this calls upon us to also figure how do we engage in Addis Ababa? Because sometimes the mistake we make as citizens, we can engage here very well around the Commission, which is very welcoming to us, and with which we work in a variety of ways very well. But the political decisions are made in Addis Ababa. So we also figure out the Pan-African Citizens Network organizes an annual Citizens Continental Conference preceding the January-February summit of the AU. So we also need to see how we occupy that space so we learn better about how to push the political organs to implement or to adopt, formally adopt, so that they can open the implementation what the human rights organs have done. And also how we engage in country how our in-country campaigns look like. So like the stories that were given by the sister from Mauritania, the sister from Uganda, giving practical examples of things that are going on in-country. How can we run campaigns using that, in social media, using the radio, uh, and so on. Uh, so I think it's important for us to see how we push for adoption, where they've not been adopted, like with the statelessness uh, and right nationality protocol, but then for actual ratification by our states uh, um, at the national level. I think the DOE asked an interesting question, which for me I've never put my mind to, that what do we do with unidentified persons whose bodies are lying in our mortuaries uh, across our continent? How do we get to know who they are, what their nationality is, what their families are, when their bodies are clean? So I haven't figured that out. What I do know that most countries' laws say that if bodies are unclaimed after a certain period, the public authority will bury the body, uh, even if it is uh, of an unnamed person. So we just do hope that we can engage in situations whereby they keep some basic attributes, maybe even DNA evidence uh, or DNA records of such persons, so that should we be able to claim later. Uh, uh, it can be done. Uh, I think the final gentleman that spoke spoke about one of our challenges of implementation. That, for instance, on this issue of the right to nationality, a couple of uh, colleagues engaged in litigation on the African Court of Human and People's Rights and got a very strong decision, the Anudo decision, uh, on this issue. And the question is, how do we ensure implementation? Because the state in question, which is Tanzania, has not yet implemented the decision. Um, and that's why, again, as I say, one of the key focuses of the foresight that we put in the draft plan is the question of implementation and how we form strong partnerships for implementation between the citizens and those that govern us at national level, regional level, continental level. Um, because it's a challenge of implementation and how we robustly hold the state's account. Sometimes, I'm not saying that's what happened here, is when human rights activists have gotten a good decision from the court, they kind of expect that the decision will implement itself. But you know, the government will lose some publicity, will take space in the paper, will discuss it with the media and so on, and the decision will implement itself. Publicity is very important. Uh, but beyond that, implementation is as much a political issue as a legal issue. 
So we need to look at how we use parliaments, especially parliamentary committees that deal with law, that deal with human rights, that deal with foreign affairs, to hold the relevant ministers to account, where each of us in our country, we have a schedule of the decisions that have been made affecting our own country by the Commission in Banjul, by the court in Arusha, uh, by the Charters Committee, but also by national courts and have like a checklist and we get Parliament to hold the Minister of Foreign Affairs or the Minister, the Attorney General for account on how these decisions are being implemented. Uh, so yes, implementation is a big thing and I think it's one of the areas where as citizens we want to work together in coalitions in country, regional, continental. Thank you. Um, also, just to quickly add on, um, there's, um, there was a question about um, ratification or states that have not ratified um, the two um, conventions of statelessness. Um, but now, what, um, where you can hold um, your government accountable is that um, in these, some instances, those states have either ratified or signed the African Charter of the um, Rights and Welfare of the Child or the Maputo Protocol. Um, and how you may push that is in that though all those, though, all those uh, protocols, if they've signed either one of them, um, they have the right to, to nationality entrenched in there. And in so doing, meaning that now each, country, each of those countries are responsible for uh, basically uh, reporting um, on their progress in states. Uh, and yeah, so um, they. If they haven't ratified other conventions, there are other conventions that they probably didn't ratify that also have the right to nationality in them. And that's where you can hold them accountable as well. Um, and again, answering the question about, or anyone to the question about um, identification of, um, of, of deceased persons. Um, so, and, uh, yes, you become the, and I know um, from our experience in South Africa, the, the government is then responsible for your burial. Um, but ultimately, it's still problematic because if you if you pass on without a document, um, now uh, what then happens is that um, yeah, what then happens is that you, you chances are that you, you if you have children, they will struggle to now um, also obtain an identification um, because you never had um, identification. Yeah, so that's it. Euh, merci beaucoup à Thierry et à Dan pour de brillantes communications. Merci également pour les questions, les contributions et les clarifications. Euh, donc, euh, je vais juste mentionner mon aspect qui me semble important. Depuis 2015, il y a une coalition donc, euh, des organisations de la société civile euh, sur la partie qui existe. les nations. Les réseaux d'organisation qui seraient intéressés pour effectivement prendre un peu de contacts pour tous les intérêts avec nos autres pour le programme. Le 21 octobre, il y a un site qui est venu à la Sénégal, à la Sénégal, qui a même pas été à la Sénégal, qui a même pas été à la Sénégal. Donc, je vous dis que le site, parce que nous parlons de la Sénégal. Merci beaucoup.
any other well wishes for the intersex and the transgender community. To join us in this forum, we are able to discuss the status of the intersex and transgender refugees in Africa. Why do we want to discuss this? It's because uh, uh, these two constituencies face numerous challenges and that are not highlighted because of who they are. And uh, at the time, uh, or when they are exposed to be refugees or they are refugees, their issues are not looked at and they are taken like just any other person with no one to understand their special needs or they need to uh, further identify who they are and treat them as such. For that, I want to discuss, I want to welcome our panelists here to briefly, briefly tell us what exactly does the intersex and, uh, intersex and transgender refugees face and what do we need to do to help or protect the rights of these constituencies. Um, I will start with um, James Faranja to tell us briefly about the intersex community. I am the director of Intersex Persons Society of Kenya, it's an organization that is based in Kenya. So basically, um, an intersex person is a person who is born with a sexual anatomy, reproductive uh, organs or chromosomes pattern that do not fit typically definition of what is a male or what is a female. So intersex people from birth face a lot of challenges. Um, these challenges are cut across all the existing um, templates that um, tries to or that form the society from the cultural aspect, the, the medical aspect, the legislative aspect, and the civil aspect part of it. Um, Indigenous people are faced with a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to the legislative aspect of it. And this goes because, um, because when one is born, you are either expected to be a male or a female. So if by a chance that um, the expected authority in this uh, sense, uh, the delivery personnel who are adopted and being raised, if they cannot be able to tell as a child whether you are male or female, then it calls for them either put you in one of the uh, existing uh, binary systems. And it is always a very big challenge to such kind of children when they are growing up. And if by any chance you miss the other, then on spot or head spot, everything becomes a challenge to you. So there are a lot of challenges that the intersex people experience. Thank you very much, Raja, for that insight. Um, before we go further, let me just ask an example. Give us a brief about the trans people. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in, I, I, I'm Alexander Geta and I work for trans. Uh, Gender organization in Kenya uh, called Jinziam, which directly translates to my gender. Um, definitions. Basically, a transgender person is a person who is assigned male or female at birth but uh, recognizes to be the opposite sex later on. Um, the challenges faced by trans people are generally very broad, and documentation being one of the main challenges that trans people generally face in Kenya. Issues of, of identity documents, issues of being given the right documents at birth and being given the right documents even later on the age at, at 18. Oh, sorry. And so keeping all this in mind, it's very important to recognize trans people as a key population within our policy and within our, our countries and our communities and by offering and according trans people the right documentation to be who they are authentically. So thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Probably I need to welcome Platzo to just give us a perspective of the Zambian intersex. Uh, thank you very much for calling me this opportunity. And uh, my name is Amasu Sakala, 
and um, the director of an organization called Intersex Society of Zambia. So I'll just give uh, a brief of the perspective of Intersex people in regard to uh, the Zambian uh, context. So just like my colleagues uh, alluded uh, earlier, when it comes to Intersex people, uh, this uh, variation is recognized at birth. So uh, the challenges mostly come with the issues of assigning the sex. Because in most of our countries, uh, there's only a provision of either you are male or female, and it becomes a problem to uh, assign uh, an intersex person the sex which they would be identified with. And we know that society expects each individual to be identified. So when it comes to uh, the registration aspect of it, uh, noting that uh, the identity is very important, and this also uh, has uh, effects on how the person will also grow up, especially when it comes to uh, issues. Before I even go that, there's the issues of uh, wanting to align the interested person to be identified as either male or female, which is uh, doctors or even families who have uh, that child undergo surgeries. And I should make mention that these surgeries are not uh, good for the intersex uh, people because later in life they cause even psychological effects. And these uh, surgeries are irreversible. And uh, talking of uh, even issues about women health care service becomes a problem because when you talk of the services which are being offered, it's tailored to that of the male body or the female body. And uh, when you talk of refugees, taking note that refugees are people who are displaced and they seek asylum in other uh, countries. Now, if you talk of issues around uh, registration, if an intersex person has issues with registration, even in cognition at the national level, what more of now this person has been displaced and they are in a foreign country, then it makes it even more complicated and not to talk of issues around uh, even just services because we understand that when they are in, the, in those facilities as refugees, even access to uh, services such as healthcare services becomes a problem. Access to uh, services like bathrooms even becomes a, uh, a problem. Uh, I think I'll just uh, uh, end here for, for now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we want to understand and appreciate the fact that the intersex and transgender children or people are born as such and that there is need for respect, dignity, and humanizing those people. Why do I say so? It's because in most cases we want to expose these two constituencies to cultural factors that are not necessarily important and continue stigmatizing their state or living as human beings. It is important that we let the world know that these children are born as such and that they need if, and I say if, surgeries are going to, to ever uh, take effect, then they should be optional and not as medical issues and that transgender and the intersex groups can only be met uh, or even a chance to decide who they want to be when they grow up. So I want to give my colleague here, um, Kenny, Kenny is from Equality Now, to give us a brief of the laws of the country and how best, uh, best practices can be adopted in other countries to support and protect the rights of intersex and transgender. Thank you. Yes, we've had very good developments in, in kind of like respect for members of the intersex community in particular. We have, we've had intersex friendly laws in Uganda, South Africa, and even recently in Kenya, we've had laws that make accommodations for members of the intersex community. But I think in the case of Kenya, there's still a lot more to be done in terms of um, registering and um, recognizing and documenting members of the intersex community as such. Um, my colleagues have spoken in the panel about how our legal systems that were mostly um, inherited from colonial systems only had space for two um, sexes and also two genders and that has really kind of like made um, it a big problem for the religion.
administration of intersex persons who are born sometimes, you know, with um, um, what is known as ambiguous, you know, genitalia or um, sex characteristics, and also for transgender persons who do not, um, I, you know, identify with the gender or the sex that they were assigned to at birth. So it is very important um, today to speak about the need to go beyond the gender binary that um, classifies human beings according to either male or female. And it is, I think, the point of this panel today to speak to the fact that um, these gender binaries um, really limit the rights of key populations and um, members of the intersex and trans community. It is also, I think, important for us under the auspices of the 10th anniversary of the Kampala Convention to speak about um, internal displacement and also the refugee status of many trans and intersex persons who are um, pushed out of their homes, pushed out of their contexts um, by violence and discrimination on grounds of sex characteristics and um, gender identity. And it is also quite lamentable that we are still suffering from a major problem in, in our continent that the, very, the most vulnerable um, internally displaced persons and refugees are usually caught um, in a cruel refugee system that um, exacerbates vulnerabilities and exacerbates risk of issues such as abuse, um, lack of resources and lack of access. Um, my colleague Pato spoke specifically about the problems that are encountered by uh, intersex internally displaced persons in the refugee camp setting, which again is very binary in the sense that members of the intersex community have problems accessing services, um, including health services. So it, it is important for us to kind of like talk about the gaps that exist at the moment. And I think it was in 2017, there was a PhD student at, um, at the Center for Human Rights in Pretoria who spoke of the need of having a model law on intersex um, issues and intersex rights issues. And I think it is time that, I mean, that presentation was made in, in the context of the NGO forum and in the context of civil society led convenings um, prior to the ordinary session of the SHPR. And I think we need to go back to that place where we have to talk about, you know, do, is it time that we have a clear uh, model law that can be adopted by African countries on the, on the need uh, to recognize both trans and intersex persons. We know that at the African Commission level, we've seen Resolution 275, which um, speaks about minimizing and eliminating violence on grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. And I think that it is time for us to also talk about violence against intersex persons on grounds of their sex characteristics. Um, I think my takeaway from this uh, panel and these presentations that are emanating here is for us to very clearly think about what is the effect of having a binary system on the lives not only of um, men and women who are forced to conform to gender norms, sometimes at the expense of their health and well-being, but also the exacerbation of these negative effects on the lives of trans and intersex persons. So it is very important for us to think innovatively and to think generously and capaciously in a way that takes into consideration the lives of members of uh, the trans and intersex community. You have to think about your own personal circumstances when you're a human rights defender. And I think that this panel is opening up, I think, a lot of questions and ideas among the audience about how to think um, as widely as possible on who you are serving as a human rights defender. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenny. Uh, I just want to stress what Kenny has said about um, violence against the intersex and the transgender. That is something that has been happening, especially to those that um, want to tell the world who they are, and that what people want to silence them from talking about those issues. Um, in Africa, we want to pretend that these things uh, are not known to us, or we simply don't want to uh, understand them. There's need to uh, to put this into reality that there are issues within us and among us and the only better way is to resolve them uh, with a lot of humanity in them.
so that to be able to accommodate every person regardless of their gender and sexes. I also want to mention the element of um, <coughs> transgender and uh, intersex communities that are probably held in prisons. They are locked in any prison without necessarily looking at where they want to be. It is important that before they are locked in any prison or wherever, that they are requested or just asked to, and, or just to indicate where they want to be. This is because it is going to protect them from any kind of vulnerability in there, and that it is also going to give them an opportunity to be able to express themselves wherever they are. It is important that you look at the health factor of the transgender. It is something that has not been looked at in the country. We need to look at what laws and what uh, factors we, we can factor in when it comes to health issues of these communities. For that, I just want to ask through this panel, Mr. Karanja, please tell us something about the cognition and the sense of process about uh, on intersex and transgender. I think um, Kenya had a big first, uh, not a big first, um, uh, in the census, and for the first time in the history in Africa, it uh, included the dark force, where there was male, female, and intersex. And the idea was um, to try and reduce the kind of violation that the intersex people uh, face. And the first thing was to recognize the existence of intersex people in the um, country. The other thing that um, the numbers were to help the country or the states to be able to um, plan for the intersex people, bearing in mind when it comes to issues of health, they might require more um, specialized uh, care compared to the general population. Uh, when it comes to issues on education, we find that um, almost 90% of intersex children will refrain going to school due to social problems such as stigma, discrimination, and exclusion from the spaces. And bearing in mind um, the system that we have is so much uh, about male and female. So at some point, these uh, intersex uh, children and persons might lack even um, proper vehicles um, to, you know, for the services. So I think the census itself was trying to, um, or is trying to answer the very uh, question, and the first is for the existence and recognition of the intersex persons in the country. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, I'll, I'll speak on uh, the registration of trans people in, in Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, there are provisions uh, that allow trans people to change their names in, the, in their documents. Uh, that was met with a lot of advocacy with, 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 the, with the trans groups in Kenya with different uh, government uh, agencies, and that is now possible. So trans people can change their names in their documents. There's a, there's a, the court system in Kenya has really been very um, uh, instrumental with, with, in, with the trans flight in Kenya in the sense that uh, they have been court, court rulings that have been very, very favorable to the trans communities uh, in terms of association, trans people can associate, trans people can, uh, can, 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 can coordinate, trans people can uh, register the organization, so transfer can change their names within their documents. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of very positive things that are happening. Uh, most recently, uh, trans people have been included as key populations within the Kenya Aid Strategic Framework, and government is taking very proactive action in including trans people within their uh, programs in Kenya. So that's a uh, fact that has happened, and slowly by slowly we, we, we hope that uh, there are going to be uh, population estimates for the community. Right now, it's only uh, a very soon, uh, the Ministry of uh, National AIDS Control has that is doing size estimates for transgender people. It's not done nationally yet, but it's, it's a step that is happening right now. Thank you very much, Alexander. Please let's give to Patsy. Uh, thank you very much. So, just on, uh, on the registration process when it comes to uh, intersex people, uh, I wouldn't say uh, unfortunately, but uh, 
the, the issue with the, in the Zambian context, our laws are silent uh, about uh, Inter 64, but from, uh, from uh, the way in which we've done as an organization more, uh, we've uh, noticed and sort of even Inter 64 are able to, to change their names and uh, set markup in their documents. Uh, so the issue is now maybe having the guidelines on how that process can be done. Because there was uh, a court ruling uh, in which uh, there was an interested person who had uh, requested uh, through the courts that their name and six months had been changed, of which they were granted. So with that uh, uh, kind of case, it uh, also entails that the process is doable when it comes to uh, the intersex uh, people. The only thing is when we have laws which can guide and maybe policies which can guide the, the intersex people to follow through to know that if I'm an intersex person, these are the procedures on how I can change my, my sex marker or even my, my name. And the other thing is uh, Zambia should be undertaking its next census and we are hopeful that uh, intersex people would be included in that census to also ascertain the number of uh, intersex people to facilitate for obtaining uh, services uh, for this uh, community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hansel. We've had our panelists. And uh, because this is a key concern for all the African countries, I would like to open this to the panel, uh, to the forum, to just have two or three questions around the same. Yes, I'll see those hands. Um, Thank you. This is Cynthia Okosa from uh, Human Rights Institute of South Africa. My question is on the waiting period uh, for surgical procedures. How is uh, uh, Zambia and, and, and Kenya just, I'm just uh, looking at your experiences in uh, the country? As I do know, in South Africa we have two hospitals um, where if one uh, wants to undergo a surgical uh, procedure, would have to Know, go and put their name and you know the, way, the queue is very long and uh, that also uh, places a lot of demand and frustration on intersex and transgender uh, people to actually successfully transform. Um, so if you could just please share your experience. My name is Gladness from Tanzania. I'm a journalist and professional. Uh, <coughs> congratulations for uh, good presentations, all of you. Uh, I have a, a small question uh, for the intersex people in Kenya. Do you, you uh, around here, Mr. Karanja, do you have any censorship uh, so that you can have a clear data of how many are they, uh, even uh, those who are born at the hospital or at the village levels or community levels? I think if you have uh, clear data, to start with, it will be a, a good and uh, a good job for you so that we can also adapt. Uh, in Tanzania, we consider them as the people with disabilities. They are there, but it is still underground. And I think it is high time now. We have to use the same format as you mentioned. Uh, at the second time of the presentation that you introduced a form, I don't know, at the hospital or in uh, any particular note, maybe at the passport when they want to, I don't know, that they have to mention they identify themselves, a uh, male, a female, or intersex. But also, uh, in terms of we encourage uh, parents parents to uh, make, to give them space and we don't encourage such a, as you mentioned. We encourage them to have a space at the certain age, let's say 18, and then they have to, go to uh, consider themselves a male or a female or a woman. So I think that is human rights. Uh, session was passed for them. Thank you. The organization called Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum. 
Um, I would like to comment on what Alexandra talked about, about the issue of name change. Yeah, indeed, in most of the countries, there is that provision for change of names. But the challenge would come in the use of these names. If you change a name that was ordinarily applicable, from a name that was ordinarily applicable to females, and now you have a name that is ordinarily applicable to males, the use of this name becomes very difficult. I am talking from experience, I have handled a couple of cases of uh, transgender persons who change their names, but they can't even study in the new names, you know? You go to an institution, you try to um, uh, register the students, and they refuse. They say this, we can't accept this name, but when someone actually went through the, the proper legal steps of name change. So that means it is actually not effective because someone can't use this name comfortably. So those are some of the challenges when it comes to name change for transgender persons and as interested persons. And then also for those of them who are refugees, uh, they usually face challenges such as um, when they go to a, when they seek refuge in a country, probably that has laws that are let, that, that are more aggressive than the country they were in previously. Things become extremely um, um, more difficult for them. And then also, uh, since the refugee, for those who are confined in the refugee camps, because of the crowding, the, the, the crowded arrangements in some of the settlements, it becomes extremely easy for them to be prone to violence when they are discovered, um, for those of them who are living in hiding. So I think that the issue for transgender refugees or and intersex refugees, they are still uh, in a very delicate position. I think we need to continue to advocate for governments to not only um, recognize them, but also offer them special protection. Um, which is over the power of what is given to the other refugees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Martin Kale, and I'm from Liberia, and I work for. I think we can do uh, as a continent is to go beyond just uh, protocol and conventions but to also ensure that we have national laws that also protect transgenders and intersex persons. Because in my country, if you look at the penal code, there's no uh, provision, there's no articles, there's no penalty within the penal, in the penal code that protect uh, transgender persons and intersex persons. So uh, I want to elevate the conversation to see how nationally we can uh, we can adapt national laws that will protect those group of persons because the perception uh, is very huge for us to consider them as persons with disability and next year there will be a census in my country and the draft document, the draft uh, questionnaires that some of us have been fortunate to see there is no land for intersex and transgender persons. Thank you. I'm Leslie as the president of Alliance of LGBT organizations in Ghana and other organizations that work in the equality and equality circles. And I just first wanted to say that uh, to talk about the fact that we are not requesting for any special rights for any group of people. What we expect is that wherever transgender or intersex people are found within any refugee camp or any, they must be given equal rights and given attention as they may need as a different people within that group of refugees. So that people do not start thinking that these people are asking for other rights that are not what we all want or what is does not exist. It's something that exists, what we are saying is that people should be accorded that right, should be recognized as being individual and unique in their own sense. Another thing is that I wanted to say that we need to comment on the fact that within the issue of statelessness for especially intersex people, where the idea that when an intersex person decides, or even a transgender person decides to transition, within that period, the person is obviously granted stateless because they can't access services because of their new identity. 
um, um, because of the fact that maybe now their name has changed, they can't access a passport as a, as a, as a person who is of a particular country, or they can't even go to do certain basic things. So I want us to recognize that and also put that as we go ahead with our advocacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenya, in 1994. And after the ceremony was done, there was a lot of uh, conversation and the, the, the media was very um, aggressive and wrote very bad uh, messages uh, about the doctor. And so the doctor felt very isolated and kind of just went into hiding because he couldn't take all the, the, the backlash. Fast forward to, to, to now, the the provisions of doing the surgeries are, are not yet articulated within um, uh, the the, ministry, uh, the 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 Kenya Health Policy. Yes. So there are no special, there are no guidelines for the management of, of, of the process of the, of the SRS sexual reassignment surgery. So doctors really don't know what their mandate is. They don't know what to do. So that's something we're also trying to advocate for to ensure that those guidelines are indicated within. Um, 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 that policy. So, so currently, no. So doctors can't really perform the, the surgery as much as they want to in, in within government hospitals. But in private hospitals, it can happen. But within public hospitals, it cannot happen because there is that lack of the, the guidelines and the policies. And for, for the rest of the comments, I, I completely agree with everything that you've all said, and thank you so much for your prior, uh, for your contributions. Thank you, Alexander. Um, Karanja, to address So I will answer um, the question, especially from the journalist from Tanzania, on the issue of uh, data. And one of the things is that, um, from a state perspective, we never had the data that we expect to meet. Uh, military in the body that is mandated by the states from um, statistics are uh, produced. So, um, but we do not have a proper method of tracking the number of children who are born in hospitals. But um, there is a peculiar or some sort of uh, issue that happens in most uh, Kenyan hospitals, and that is when. Um, a woman gives birth to an intersex child, one of the immediate documents once it happens is a birth notification. So in Kenya, instead of getting a birth notification either written M or F, what has been happening is that doctors have been putting a question mark. But the question mark on that um, child, um, it becomes a problem to the parent because it brings in the issue of mental health of this parent and then it brings in a cultural aspect of um, uh, their mates when you give such, uh, that are ordered when you give birth to an intersex child. They are, and one of the things is that these children are asked. The other thing is that um, they are supposed to be killed or, or regarded as outcasts if they are to be given a chance to grow. So I think um, data is very essential because it helps to understand the distribution and how many they are. And that number helps us um, to inform in creating policies that are interested in protect the intersex person. So I think Kenya and many other African countries have a wrong way to go, but um, we should start the conversation um, recognizing the intersex persons. Thank you. My colleague here, can you to kind uh, just give a difference between persons with disability and intersex and transgender persons for better understanding. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand that these systems that have been created by, um, I, I think it arises from a lack of legal innovation that we wholesale adopted some of these kind of like cultural and legal specifications and categorizations of human beings from colonial powers in a way that continue to harm um, African people. I sub sub saharan Africa is usually recorded as having a higher incidence of persons who are intersex than the rest of the world. I think it's something that arises from, um, you know, things such as genetics. I don't think it's a bad thing and it shouldn't be a bad thing. It's just something about human diversity. 
but what we've seen is governments are trying every day to to address the problem in their mind that this is a problem, um, the problem of persons who are intersex in ways that um, lead to even more abuses than they're supposed to be curing. So my colleague James mentioned the, ins the instance in Kenya where intersex children are born with a question mark on their birth notification, the, the question mark is placed on their birth notification form. And the effect that this has is that over, over time, it, creates a lot of problems for the intersex person because there is nowhere in the Kenyan law that says that it is okay to put a question mark. But then also this form does not have a space for intersex or a space that says that, you know, we are going to put another mark here but then over time we can change it depending on, you know, how the intersex child grows. So that's just one of the examples of the bad innovations that we are, we are making so that we can compensate for bad legal systems that don't recognize trans and intersex people. The other is recognizing or saying that intersex persons are persons with disability. There's really nothing, in, there's really nothing that makes an intersex person who's born able-bodied uh, a person with disability. Um, intersex persons should be accorded full human rights as everyone else and they should just be called intersex. Intersex is not a disability. Um, intersex persons um, have the potential of becoming, you know, like fully realized as any other human has the potential of being um, fully realized. And then that also comes to the question of persons who are transgender. Sometimes we see um, claims that, you know, transgender persons are mentally ill and so they are also suffering from a mental disability and this really informs the problems that we see when transgender persons are trying to kind of like access health services including you know sexual reassignment surgery and it's it's very important that we see human beings as a human being um, we come from a colonial era where black people were called all manner of things you know we were considered not very we were considered to be of a lower iq or a lower form of human development, and that's how we were seen. But over time, we have fought against those negative preconceptions to say that Africans or people who live in Africa are full human beings who have full potential as like any other human being. And I think that it is time for us to accord the same consideration, the same generosity to persons who are transgender and intersex. To just speak about, you know, um, it's true that um, people who work on the rights of trans and intersex issues are not asking for special rights. Um, it is important to stress that human rights are always changing, they are dynamic, and I think it is the mark of a bad human rights defender, I'm sorry to say, that you support half of certain rights and then you don't support other human rights. Lastly, I would like to say that for the persons who are kind of like seeing potential in, uh, interventions as human rights defenders from the presentation here, I think it's a good idea to come and speak to some of the panelists, maybe get advice, maybe do some networking and see how we can collaborate on these issues. We note that in especially parts of North Africa, Francophone Africa, Northwest Africa, the Sahel, Central Africa, we are seeing the very slow progress being made, especially on the issue of intersex rights um, and also on the question of transgender rights. So that, that's, my, that's my intervention for now. Thank you very much, Kenny. Um, indeed, there is no relation between disability and intersex and strong. Let me just give you a question part so to finish with uh, an indication on surgeries and what do you recommend? So when it comes to issues around uh, uh, surgeries for uh, intersex children, um, I'm specifically talking about intersex children because that's where our journeys as intersex persons start from. So for me as a person who is uh, advocating for the rights of uh, intersex persons, my recommendations would be that uh, no surgeries should be done on intersex children until such a time when they are able to consent to those surgeries if at all they want them. Because like in our context, uh, when it comes to surgeries, uh, they come with a cost. Because the question would be, who is, who is going to bear the cost once those surgeries start? 
because it's a life long process of uh, doing this series uh, time uh, and, and again. And when we look at our our contents, I don't think many hospitals, uh, like in my in, in my country, I don't think we have that specialized uh, uh, equipment to do the specialized tests for for intersex uh, people. And for some which we have, they come at a higher cost. And in most cases, uh, those who are underprivileged are the ones who normally suffer the, the consequences. So, uh, in just closing, on my side, I would say I would not recommend uh, the surgeries. I think I can end here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pazzo. Uh, Mr. Grant, do you have any recommendation? Thank you so much. Um, I would say that um, so far where we are as an African uh, continent, intersex people don't need equality. What they need is equity. We need first to recognize them, let them come on the table, then from there we talk about equality. Um, secondly, I would um, ask the Commission to adopt the resolution and claim that um, you violate human rights violations um, against intersex people by the state should be uh, stopped at once. And this uh, should ensure that some of these states um, adopt the legislative and other measures that ensure that there is a proper commission for the intersex persons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, my recommendation would be to uh, respect bodily autonomy is and to to to, to respect uh, people's journeys and choices. Uh, if someone wants to 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 live as the, the, the as the truly authentic self, then that should be allowed. Uh, it's, it's a question of processes and, 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 and procedures available for such things to exist. And for me, it would be ensuring that there is a legal environment that is conducive for the existence of trans people. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Can you have any I think my recommendation has really come out of my presentation today that we need to think about how the gender binaries um, really end up creating a lot of unnecessary hardship on the lives of transgender and intersex persons. Um, someone, my, my Ghanaian colleague spoke about how um, trans and intersex persons are rendered effectively stateless. Um, when they start um, the transitioning process um, at the legal level where they are starting to change their identity documents. And I think that was um, stressed by my colleague from um, the HRPF in Uganda who also spoke about how sometimes transitioning opens you up to a lot of, like to even more hardship because you are now marked as transgender. And my only recommendation for that would be we need laws that provide for um, persons who wish to change their names and gender markers to be made much easier. I think that it is only in Africa where this is made into a very long, drawn-out process of that creates a lot of hardship for any person, and especially intersex and trans people. We need to start thinking about whether it is time to adopt a model law on intersex rights issues across the continent to ensure that intersex persons, regardless of the country they are in, are enjoying the highest standard of human rights protections and the highest standards of you know, health and well-being. Um, and also my other recommendation would be for persons who don't work on these issues and you don't see these issues happening in your country, don't think that there are no intersex persons in your country. It's just that sometimes they are so marginalized from the human rights discourse, from the gov governance discourse, that they need help from larger human rights organizations to start getting their foot in the door and to getting their voices heard. So those are my recommendations. Thank you very much, panelists. And because we were told to give time, I think we have been able to respect that. 
but as I close, I just want us to appreciate in Africa that intersex and the transgender people are just any other person. We need to open up our voices and just amplify that for them. And, and with them, for the purposes of having a, a state that leaves no one behind, or an Africa that leaves no one behind, we also want to make sure that we have proper health facilities for every other person regardless of their sex. Because then that means we will have everyone covered in all health and universal health structures. And also, as Africa and our culture, because it defines us mostly, we want to be very sensitive on how or who we want to call our, our populations, especially the intersex and transgender in these issues, and continue protecting those communities, knowing very well that they are any other human being. It is important that we are very sensitive about the terminologies we use to refer to these people, or to refer especially where we have the intersex parents in our It is important that I mention that they prefer being called intersex and that we should adopt as such to properly uh, respect the human rights of any other person, including the intersex groups. For this, I say thank you very much. And we continue discussing this, even in other spaces. Thank you.